Uh, a couple of general points I would like to go through at a high level of abstraction, not more than a couple, you know, a few, without detailed explanation or defense. So I'm just moving out of the line. Oh, I know what, I can darken the projector. No, 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 no. Um, without g going into detailed discussion or whatever, just to sort of put them in the, into the um, uh, environment, the sort of the thinking space. Um, one is, a slogan that uh, is partly inspired by Richard Dawkins' title, The Blind Watchmaker, which I've replaced with The Blind Mathematician. <laughs> and my reason for doing that is that evolution couldn't work as it has done, but for the fact that natural selection has made a lot of, made a lot of mathematical discoveries and used them in very interesting and interestingly varied and complex ways. And I'll just give you a few examples, and I expect there are more than a million more that I haven't known, and many of them are probably more interesting. One I alluded to briefly was um, that there's a form of control uh, which we all now are familiar with called homeostasis, where there's a state which is in, or a region of a state space which is okay or desirable or preferred or something and there are others that are inferior and a system can sense whether something is in or not in that state and if it's not in that state can also somehow compute, derive the direction of change required to put it back in that state and then can turn on some physical, chemical process which will initiate that change and may or may not be enough to get it back into that state. I mean, you die if you don't succeed in some cases. So one of the earliest examples that's mentioned by Ganti in the Chemiton book is that uh, the notion, if he's right, that the earliest organisms had a, were enclosed in a mem membrane, or it might be a variant of that where they're stuck onto a rock or something in the membrane, which is part of it, but something that allows stuff in or out can depend on osmotic processes where molecules get in and out depending on the difference of uh, concentrations of those molecules. Um, there is a danger if some desirable molecule, type of molecule is coming in that you get too much in and the whole thing explodes and you burst. Okay? So you may have to detect that it's gone too far and you have to take steps to reduce the rate and that might be done <laughs> by... We have an example. Example. The, 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 people and cookies. cookies. People and cookies. Oh, right, thank you. Yes, right. Uh, except we are not very good at detecting that we've got too far. But anyway. So this mechanism is not working very well. Yeah. Evolution hasn't done a good job. And uh, so there are some things that, that will just say yes or no, which is very primitive. This kind of stuff is good. Let it in. This stuff isn't. Shut the door. Uh, but. And you can say even that is a kind of very primitive mathematical relationship for which evolution produced mechanisms which could uh, be usefully deployed. Uh, homeostatic control is all over the place in organisms. I just gave one little example. Uh, humans rediscovered it billions of years later in the Watt governor, in self-organizing windmills. Uh, <coughs> does anyone not know about self-organizing windmills? <laughs> okay, I, I'm teasing a bit. You've probably seen a windmill, or seen pictures of a windmill, oh, I'm not sure I've seen a real one, where you have a big wheel which is used to collect energy from wind, which is turned by gears to make a millstone or something, grind or pump, pumping water or doing all kinds of things. And there's another little wheel which is at right angles to the big wheel. And is it obvious to you what the little wheel is for? Turning okay. into the wind. It's going to measure the extent to which it is getting energy from the wind and in which direction the energy, the wind is coming and it will um, turn in such a way as to minimize the amount of energy it's getting from the wind and in doing so it maximizes the amount of energy that the big wheel is getting. And this is a clever engineering design. I don't know how many times it was rediscovered. Um, I don't even know, I should, could have looked it up, whether it preceded the Watt governor or not. Um, but it's clearly the same kind of thing of a negative feedback control mechanism. And in a situation like that, you have what I've been calling information and energy. But if you look at it a different way, it's all energy. Using, but as you will never always find it useful to say it's all information, but I expect some, someone will say, yes, it is all information. But it seems to me that when you get a kind of structure where some kind of 
energy is being used to manipulate the deployment or acquisition or manipulation of another kind of energy, there's information processing in the most basic form. And evolution just finds more and more examples of more and more complexity, uh, of different kinds of complexity, and puts them to use. So I'll give you another example. Um, there are many species, for instance all mammals, that start with very small, with relatively weak muscles and, and, and maybe weak bones and various other things, and they grow. But in the process, they have to be able to do things, have to control their actions and so on. But as you get heavier, bigger, stronger, and so on, the re requirements for producing movements to achieve some of the new goals that you have, like reaching up to things you couldn't do before, or jumping, which you couldn't do before, or old goals, like picking something up and putting it in your mouth, which you could have done before, they change because you're dealing with things with different angular momentum, different moments of inertia, different dimensions. So the control mechanisms either get constantly replaced as an organism is grown, or they're parameterized, and the parameters are adjusted during the development. And it seems to me, although I couldn't give you any kind of detailed scientific description or evidence as to how it happens, it's almost certainly the case that somehow evolution discovered there's ways of building systems that have a kind of design that can be parameterized so that the thing can be adjusted as the requirements for the amounts of x, y, and z, or whatever they are, velocity, <coughs> force, or whatever, change. And furthermore, if you have, a, if you have that kind of parameterization of design, then that can also play a role in natural selection because you can start trying different initial parameters and maybe you can have a, another level of, of uh, parameterization for mechanisms that produce these mechanisms. So, so what I'm saying there is that evolution has not just lots of physical stuff which it uses. There are systematically uh, constructed or evolved, and in, in individuals constructed, and in some individuals learned, construction kits, things that make new things that weren't there before, by reorganizing what is there before, and it might be matter, it might be information, it might be some combination of them. And this goes on all over the place, and we could, st I, I had a diagram, but I think I'll say it in words, and you lot are intelligent enough to not leave my diagram. There had to be a fundamental construction kit provided by physics and chemistry, and I alluded earlier to some of the requirements on that fundamental construction kit to do with the kinds of changes it requires, but also the kinds of resistance to change it requires for things that are going to be able to survive through other kinds of changes in a reliable way. Um, and somehow, by mechanisms which, about various things are known by biologists, more than I can tell you, more than I know, but I'm sure much less is still waiting, sorry, much more is waiting to be discovered than already, I'm pretty sure. Could turn out wrong that there's some textbook somewhere that's got it all, but <laughs> I doubt it, that, that there's gonna be a lot more to be discovered about the kinds of construction kits that evolution had to build in order to produce new things because the original construction kit was itself too primitive but could be used to build some intermediate stages which could then be used and w we humans have been through that through the last n thousand years or whatever and spectacularly in the last half century with information processing construction kits the number of kinds of levels of change of development of new technology new kits for making the old type of kits in new and better ways and so on, which then gave you new ways of making replacements for the newer kits. It's just been quite spectacular. I think some of it was referred to in your talk and implicitly if not using my language. And again, there are ways in which that works only if patterns are discovered which are reusable. And they may be reusable in different ways. They may be just patterns into which you plug numbers. But as Frege anticipated, there may be patterns into which you plug construction kits or other things. Um, and I'm conjecturing that evolution discovered all that long before us. Yeah. Have you had a chance to listen to Les Valiant uh, Turing Award lecture? Which but he has not, unfortunately, he has not written it down necessarily. No. But he asks, he's asking there the, the following question. He says, well, 
So we don't know exactly how life started uh, on Earth. But if it started, it started, must have started with something fairly primitive. You know, people are still debating, you know, maybe RNA wall, how did RNA get them? But maybe amino primitive. acids. Mm. Let's suppose it started with amino acids. So he said, well, so, so nature uh, has to learn all this stuff that you have to, to so, supposed to learn. He says, it had about four billion years to do it. Is that enough time? Oh, yeah. that's... I, I, Is that I, enough time? And he says, he actually proposed something which I thought was very ambitious. I don't know if we can carry it out. He says, well, we have today a, a lot of theory about learning. We develop computational learning theory, machine learning, but learning different things. Given the pace of evolution, is four billion years enough to learn the, the level of sophistication that all yeah. these kids are now exist? Is it, is it a credible story? Well, I... I've had exactly the same question in my own mind and I used it as an objection to some of my colleagues in saying we now know with genetic algorithms how it all works and I say what would happen if you tried to operate, use them from the molecules to try to get elephants saying but and you can start computing the number of options at every sp stage in the Stein space, the number of uh, steps you need to get from a molecule to an elephant, the number of square or cubic millimeters of usable space on the planet, the number of billions of years, and then you can start thinking about how many decision choices would fit into that. It's exactly the... I didn't realize he had I'll said send, that. I'll send out a pointer. It's a very sure. interesting question. Yeah. Anyway, what I'm saying is... Uh, what I'm, uh, it leads into one of the other points uh, I was going to make about all that, which um, Susan has already read, um, which is that we have discovered ways of fighting the combinatorial explosion, which you were referring to there, the space of options just can, you can easily show that if you try to specify a design problem in the wrong way, a design problem for which solutions exist, you will show that the search space might require more decisions to be taken in four billion years on the surface of the planet than there are atoms in the universe. Things like that can come out. Not so that how that, you know, this genetic algorithm now is optimization algorithms actually not very good. They are much better algorithm, you know, sure. for example, simulated annealing very often is a much better algorithm. Right, and there are lots of yeah. different variations on algorithms and meta-algorithms and, yeah. and I'm just saying there's a collection, there's a sort of space of things which, e which people in AI and evolutionary computation and software engineering and theoretical computer science are beginning to understand and my rather extravagant conjecture is that a great deal of that complexity was discovered and used by the blind mathematician. The blindness means that even nothing it existed that knew it was happening, mm -hmm. but it was happening anyway. And I'm, I say the same sort of thing I think goes on in very young children. Uh, they learn all kinds of things, and I'll give you some examples. They don't know they're learning them, but they're learning them and using them. And we can look. And then later they develop the metacognitive architecture that enables them to reflect on some of those things and engage in debates. And that's part of the story about how you get to Euclid, I think. But just going back a bit. So um, what I'm suggesting then is that there's, a, uh, there's this huge search space, which you usefully introduced as a problem for evolution. And I'm going to say that one of the kinds of ways that evolution uh, may have and appears to have dealt with it is by introducing new ways of abstracting so that you can, instead of exploring all the little details of the space, you can explore categories uh, in a way that reduces the search, for instance, so that if you find an instance of something in this category, there's a standard way of transforming it to lots of, lots of cases without having to repeat the search for all those cases. And I. There are probably thousands of different variants of what I've just said. They're all interestingly different, that there are strategies for encoding your algorithms, your data structures, your information processing architecture that enable what was initially a hard combinatorial problem to be reduced in ways. And one of those ways that uh, will be familiar to any program in this room is use of memorized values, memoization, memo functions. So, for instance, if you try to compute the Fibonacci function for an arbitrary number, its value for n is going to depend on the values for n minus 1 and n minus 2. And it's very simple. You just get those values and add them. And the values for 0 and 1 or something are primitive things like 1 and 2. Or whatever. And it turns out that this, if you just take the standard definition of the function and then apply it to the number 99, you have a 
dreadful computation and it might, I, don't, I haven't, I chose 99 out of my head, I, I may, may not be big enough, it may be more than big enough to bring my computer to a halt long before it finds a solution. But there's a simple change to the way you implement that function to make sure that once you've computed Fibonacci of 20, you never compute it again, you just record that result. So you change your mechanism for applying the definition so that it has a memory that can be expanded as the mechanism is used. And this is what uh, programmers call memo functions. I came across this as a way that um, uh, the language used in Edinburgh when I was learning AI, POP2, had nice mechanisms for doing that sort of thing and lots of other things. It doesn't live up to the standards of modern software engineers, but it had lots of nice thinking tools in it. And that's just one example. So I There's suspect whole, that... By the way, just a mm -hmm. comment, the whole research error was called dynamic algorithms. Mm -hmm. Yes. The study suppose that you have inputs, to, let's suppose you're writing graph algorithms. And the graph keeps changing. You're adding a node, you're adding an edge, you're dropping an, an edge, and, and you want to compute something about the graph, but you don't want to do the computation from scratch all the time. Right. So exactly what do you need to, to keep with you? So the computation at, at each point is a small incremental computation, rather than, like we do with Fibonacci, right. rather than the whole thing from scratch. Yes, and you, need, you might for that need a variation of the memoization. Yes. Maybe you mean mm. to discover that some of your memory is no longer useful because you've moved into another problem space. So that, and maybe evolution did that by some of the differentiation. So I'm, and, and one of the reasons why I'm interested in this is that anyone who says mathematics, after all, is an anthropological phenomenon, hasn't understood the extent to which mathematics is deep down there in the universe and was discovered and used by evolution long before there were humans to produce any anthropological phenomena. And that's why I'm saying, uh, Ma ma uh, evolution is a blind mathematician. And I suspect Kant would be very happy with that. I, I mean, he didn't think in these terms. He didn't know about computers and algorithms. And, but I think it's in the spirit of what I got from him 55 or so years ago when I was trying to understand why these philosophers were wrong in saying Hume was right and, and Einstein and Ennington had refuted Kant and so on. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, so I'm, I'm trying to give a few examples and maybe that's enough for now for uh, and, and with a bright bunch of people, any one of you could probably in the next few days come up with another 10 examples of things in evolution and in learning done by non-human animals and so on that s illustrate the ability of biological mechanisms to discover and make use in a systematic way of mathematical structure in the universe. You know, in, in but you know, you take for example the point of, of uh, negative feedback. Yes. Okay? You know, you said this is a mathematical. This is mathematics in the universe, or you could say that this is a there is a concept of negative feedback, but its expression by means of linear differential equations. Ah. This is the mathematical formulation that is the the, the, the fruit of our mind that describe nature. You now, is is mathematics in nature, or is mathematics something that is the way we choose to tell the story of nature? It's a very it's important a question. Difference. Yeah. And I wasn't going to say anything about it, but since you've sent it, I may have sounded as if I was attributing to the evolutionary design process some knowledge of continuous Tele variables. In, tele in teleology. Mm. Yeah. No, I'm, the teleology in some sense is there, but the kind of mathematical richness that we have when we talk about negative feedback and differential equations and so on isn't required for what I think happened. All that's required is partial orderings of states. And uh, the standard ways in which engineers specify negative feedback con homeostatic control systems over, uh, um, are, are over precise in comparison with what's, actually, with what's actually needed in many cases. You don't af actually have to have uh, the real continuum r and points on it represented and, and actual distances represented. <coughs> All you need is more or less, getting there, moving away, and things of that sort. And I think uh, how that was done may actually be implicit in a lot of biological mechanisms in a way that's more mathematically sophisticated than current AI systems. And I'm, so I'll just elaborate on that a bit. There's a huge amount of work on machine vision, where it's assumed that you're getting all these retinal 
images and you take little measurements and then you've got to solve all the problems of where the lines are in space, which fragments of the image should be joined together to form a curve, where there's a sort of ambiguity, does it go that way or that way? And a huge amount of work is done using uh, an ont ontology of the real number continuum, differential equations, addition, multiplication, and so on. And I don't believe physiological information processing mechanisms can handle the stuff that our computers do. They operate in a space of partial orderings of qualitative changes, and there must be mathematical structure which suffices to do all the control that we find in the biological systems, including, for instance, me getting to that table while I'm looking at you lot, and I'm getting very imprecise information, but I was able to control my movement because I could tell the difference between that trajectory and this one. Mm -hmm. And I don't have to say exactly by how many degrees I've changed my direction, just that I'm now, the thing is moving away from the direction, the, the, the point of mm -hmm. uh, direction of motion. So if you switch to forms of mathematics that in some sense are understood by the mathematicians, but not lots of mathematicians who have all kinds of more abstract things than the real number continuum, but are not so much used in engineering, and are used in some parts of um, theoretical computer science and software engineering, but are not uh, used in the corresponding locations in artificial intelligence and lots of control systems. I suspect that uh, we have part of the explanation of why machine vision, although in particular, highly trained situations, spectacularly successful, you make a machine that can catch balls on which it's been trained, but slightly change the situation and it's hopeless. Uh, whereas if it had been trained on things that didn't depend on the precise values but could deal with something more mathematically imprecise, but nevertheless mathematically precise at a higher level of abstraction, then we might get much more robustness and also much more speed, uh, perhaps simpler computations, much less energy involved in the computation, and if only I could go on beyond that and say this is what we should look for in brains, but I can't. And I, I have worked in vision, I've looked at some of the details, and I'm, I, it seems to me that there's something magical about the way human visual systems, including mine, work, including not just enabling me to do this, Oops. Oops. <laughs> or not, as the case may be. <laughs> but also... <laughs> not as good as you thought. <laughs> um, it was good at achieving what I aimed at, but I didn't anticipate the side effects. <laughs> yes, and I should have, because I, I didn't remember. I mean, I had the information. If you'd asked me, is there any liquid in there, I would have said yes, probably. Yeah. <laughs> Attentional blindness. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I now want to... Still in that, in that frame of mind, examples of of evolution and mathematics, give you a couple of little videos if I can okay, not hit the wrong keys. Um, I had some here, where have I gone to? Ah. I think I must have got interrupted when I was preparing one of them, but it doesn't matter, I know where to find it, so let's just go there. My fingers are jittery partly because I haven't had enough sleep in the past four or five days. Um, especially on, Tuesday, on Monday night, <laughs> <laughs> but also old age. And who knows, maybe I'm even nervous and I'm not intelligent enough to realize that. Because um, I think I'm more or less immune to nerves. Um, okay, so let me... All right, here's um, uh, the weaver bird, which I mentioned earlier. I won't show all of it, I've turned off the side. So those are the finished nests, and, and you can see the size of the nest in relation to the size of a weaver bird. This is a young male with, um, uh, I think it's got a leaf in it, yes, it's got a, a leaf and it's doing some stuff, and then you see a slightly different view of it. As you see it's got a loop, 
and it's um, pulling stuff through the loop and then it loops it over the edge or something like that, I don't know exactly, then he finds another wrong edge and manages to make a collection of movements that gets the gripping point, oh no, he's doing, I'm, I jumped ahead, he's now made another loop, now it's getting to the end. So there's mathematical structure there that's being used by that bird's brain, the bird doesn't know it, and then when he tries to put the thing through the loop, it's gone because he forgot to hold on. <laughs> <laughs> I can do that. Poor guy. <laughs> <laughs> so, and anyway, um, I'm adding my own commentary. So these are things that David Attenborough did not mention, whether he noticed them or thought about them, I have no idea. <laughs> but um, for me, it doesn't matter. But we will have later a video you can add to it of you picking up the, the cup. Oh, yes. <laughs> Just as the, is the, is the bird forgot something, you forgot something. Yes. yes. Right. Uh, yeah. yeah, brilliant. Yes. Thank you. It took me a while to work out what you were talking about. So that's, that's the weaver bird. I didn't know until I discovered it recently that hummingbirds also make quite complicated nests, but I'm not going to show you that one. You now know it exists. And um, I want to go to um, a child and a pencil and a sheet of paper. Maybe one or two people here have seen this. Um, there was a child, I happened to be in the room, a little girl aged about 17 and a half months, uh, and she had been doing things with pencil and paper, and interestingly I noticed that when someone else tilted up the board that the sheet of paper was on, she just adjusted. She didn't push the pencils through the uh, paper. Whereas colleagues I know who try to train robots to do things would have to retrain them for the different angles, for the many of the kinds of algorithm, learning algorithms. They'll work fine on a particular plane of movement. But anyway, she didn't need that retraining. She could adjust. And then, for reasons that I have no idea, she stopped that, turned and started crawling. I don't know why. And, and then she appeared to notice, and she's holding a pencil, she appeared to notice a sheet of paper with a couple of holes and I had a cheap camera handy and I got it up and you'll see what happened um, and then I'll give you my over-interpreted <laughs> description of what was going on and you may or may not agree but it's at least a question now is that all visible what I want to do is slow this down and then restart it so she picks up the paper she pushes the pencil through it, looking very carefully what she's doing. This is slowed down, okay? Then she pulls it out, which is in itself quite difficult. She's got to hold the paper so that it uh, maintains. Then she looks on the other side and without looking at the pencil brings it round so that the end of the pencil is pointing at that thing. She pushes it in some of the way, then pulls it out and then goes back to the previous configuration and with a funny grip on the end of the pencil managed to get the end in uh, through the hole and repeats that and um, then just puts it down and does something else um, and there was nothing social about that she wasn't looking around and saying look at what I've done really which she does do in some situations now my instinct given the way my brain has been, been wired by the, those few years of mathematics and things, and is to say she was testing a hypothesis in three-dimensional topology about continuous paths through 3D space. And, or if not testing, using the hypothesis. She seemed, having shoved the pencil through a hole, to somehow know that there is a continuous trajectory which she could push this pencil through, even without looking at it, she could push the pencil through and changing its orientation appropriately while she's doing it, so it then went through and she could push it in and then put it out and go back to where she was before. Now, I suspect we do not have any language that at the right level of precision will say what she was doing. In other words, what information structure she was getting. But I think it's something close to discovering topological relations in three-dimensional space. And if you watch children playing, there's an awful lot of that. Uh, but if you don't have that thought in mind, you won't see it. If you're just looking for whether they can or can't solve the puzzle, you set up your diagram, your experiment to test. You won't see all the other things going on in your, in your lab. 
and that's a comment on my friends in, in, in psychology and I just feel sorry for them because they're under so much pressure to produce papers with statistical results and graphs and averages and so on. But anyway, and the reason that's a problem uh, be, is that you can't get graphs and averages if you do the kind of thing that Piaget did and I was being, doing that, looking at individuals and trying to analyze in detail what, what they do. And Piaget, um, I mentioned briefly Diana, I'll say to everybody, had two books produced posthumously, well at least English versions were, one on possibility and one on necessity, and hardly anybody knows about them. And I, I was asking lots of psychologists, I, I thought, Piaget must have thought about the problems I'm thinking about. Children making mathematical discoveries about what's possible and how the possibilities are constrained by necessities. And eventually, I got a reply from Annette Carmel of Smith saying, I think he did something very late on that, which she obviously hadn't read, but she'd known about it. And I then used Google and found that there was one book on possibility, one on necessity. And a lot of very interesting experiments, unfortunately they're expensive. I managed to get second-hand pair, quite cheaply. Uh, experiments on children between ages three and about 13 or 14, in which he sets up some cleverly designed apparatus and then asks children in the one set of questions, what can happen now? What, what could you do? And so on. And gets interestingly varied results depending on the ages of the children and the kind of experiment. And the other one, it's more about can I do this or can't I? So in one of them he's got a, a thing that can be either rotated about a vertical axis or can be rotated about a horizontal axis or sequences of combination of both. And it's got marks and you ask the child, can you rotate it so that this thing that's in the top left goes to the top right? And that's a non-trivial thing if, uh, if you've only got um, certain kinds of patterns of rotation. For some kinds of patterns of rotation, it'll be easy, and others it won't. But for example, you've got a vertical axis, and you've got a disk over here, and there's a mark on the top, in your case, right, uh, sorry, left, my, my right, your left, can I rotate that disc around this thing any number of times until this thing over here is over there? Yes, you say? Well, uh, it depends on more of the setup, I think. I can't, uh, I can't, I can't visualize so, what you're actually doing. Okay, it's a, it's, a, it's a metal disc, say, right. and there's a black sheet of paper stuck on right. the thing over here, and you rotate it here. Right. Can you get it to there? Right. And the answer is no, because uh, you can get it to here, yeah. but not to there. Right. Okay. And interestingly, you find variations, and, and then you start for each child, you ask questions and so on. And you can't do that if you want to produce graphs. But if you want to produce deep, interesting data, you can do that sort of thing. Unfortunately, I don't think he was able to produce deep, interesting theories. But that may just be my limitation, because I didn't work hard enough trying to understand what he was really getting at. But it's clear to me that. Uh, and I think before he died, it was clear to him also that he needed to have much earlier in life encountered artificial intelligence and try to build theories that could be programmed and tested in, in running robots. But I'll give you um, one other example, which is fun. I think I've talked to someone in this room about it. He asked kids, what will happen? This is in the book on necessity. Uh, what will happen if you've got a glass and some liquid up to a certain point and you've got another glass and you pour some, put some liquid in? And I think all the kids in the group he was talking about, but it doesn't matter whether it's all or only some, said that the, the surface would go up. I mean, he might have asked them specifically, will it go up or down or say where it is, or he might have just left them to say what would happen. But um, there was um, sort of consensus to go up. And then he set up apparatus where there's this glass, liquid, a pipette, narrow tube with a little control valve, which allows you to drop one drop at a time, which chemists need for some of their experiments. And he sets it up and says to the child, you're looking carefully, and the child watches the tap being turned and sees a drop, and then he says, did the level go up or not? And uh, you get interesting answers at different ages. At one level, they lie and say yes, because they had previously said it'll go up, <laughs> or whatever. And whether they're actually hallucinating it going up, or whether they don't admit they're wrong, or whatever, that's another question. We need a theory of mind which we don't have, but that comes out. Um, another group say, um, no, it didn't, and then if you start asking it, well, why not? You previously said it would go up. Um, 
Some gives the right answer, uh, that the older ones, some of the older ones. It did go up, but the amount it went up was so small I couldn't see it. Okay. And they are there using a fairly rich theory about the nature of perception as well as the nature of change and motion in space. And then some of them lie, sorry, not lie, build new hypotheses. If it's only one drop, it sort of isn't enough to make it up, they, it, some is kind of interaction goes on, it gets eaten or something, and they're using other, you know, we don't get fatter, we get visibly fatter when we eat, so maybe it's something like that. I don't remember enough of the detail, but there's a style of experimentation that I'm trying to draw attention to, and I'm saying that in a lot of his examples, he's using mathematical structure of space and time and motion and, and mechanical devices to set up the situations where he's probing what these kids can do. And in some sense, that's happening with Betty, except that she does most of the setting up herself. So how are we doing for time? Uh, if you want to have some questions, then okay. you probably want to stop. Right. So um, I'm going to try to discipline myself. There, the, you, what you're probably are aware now that I've shown you a tiny subset of what I've been thinking about for the last three or four years. And every now and again, something happens that means I've got to go back and change a lot of what I've done, because I realize, like the child, the drop didn't make the thing new. Um, and I've been trying to find ways of organizing it. And one way was to say that there are the there's initial construction kit and then some um, extra construction kits came and different sort of construction kit, concrete construction kits. Abstract construction kits which involve rules that can be used to control concrete ones. Hybrid construction kits. Uh, I'm just dropping the phrases that I'm trying to define them. And um, at one point, construction kits for building construction kits so that the search time required to get these construction kits can be collapsed by using a construction kit constructor instead of having to search for a new type of construction kit. But that depends on the construction kit constructor having this, uh, encoding in its design some mathematical regularity which can be instantiated in the right s space of possibilities to do something useful and speed up evolution. So I've just been doing this and every now and again I talk to someone and a new ideas come and I go and write a, a, a note. And I know I haven't done the other videos, but that doesn't matter. You can probably guess what some of them. Uh, a little observation continuing the theme about 3D uh, topology. Most people uh, have seen a magician or conjurer or whatever it is who will take a couple of rings and bang them wave around, demonstrate that they're solid, bounce them, and then wave, and suddenly they're linked. Now, that should be impossible if they really were solid, impermeable things. But you don't have to teach normal human beings uh, 3D topology. They know enough to realize it's impossible. And it's not because they've gone around trying and is constantly failing, and they're now surprised <laughs> this clever person can do what they failed. They really do know something wrong is happening here. And so what I'm saying is that in a lot of ordinary, everyday, human common sense, there's mathematical competence at work, but not recognized. And I think at various stages in evolution, some of these competences came to be uh, observed internally by new architectural uh, metacognitive subsystems. Uh, for instance, uh, one of the ways that would be useful is if something that worked previously doesn't work in a new situation, if you can remember what you did previously, then you might be able to compare what will happen then and what happens now in order to look for some explanation of why it didn't work. And that's metacognition, thinking about what you thought and used as opposed to just thinking about what's in front of you and what happened, which would be the cognition. And then you might start having meta-metacognition because you can start testing your theories. Later you can start finding that your kids are making mistakes which you can try, if you've got a theory about what's going on inside them, you can use your metacognition applied to them and start trying to work out how to help them. And later on they start arguing back and then you have to start developing a language for using meta-metacognitive discussions and so on. And I suspect that there were zillions of episodes and I don't know how many millions, or, well not millions, thousands of years um, in which the kind of thing that Gibson said was important for perception, not that when you see things you build, as Marr and many other AI people have suggested, uh, three-dimensional representations of the structure that are there, of a kind that could generate images, you build something else, much more abstract, which can be used to solve problems. And some of that may have bugs and the process of debugging depends on the metacognition finding the bugs and then it becomes 
um, a communal, a, a cultural thing where people start sharing their knowledge, their bugs, their debugging processes. And I suspect Euclid and other things like that, all those m great mathematicians, came out of a long process of that sort of thing, which all started with evolution of the blind mathematician making wonderful discoveries, which led to all of this stuff. Now, I think there's a huge amount that is hand-waving. There are lots and lots of examples, and I try to collect them from all over the place, and lots of questions I can formulate to which I don't know the answers, but I've left those, most of those out of today's thing. And I'll stop there. And now I listen. Questions? Or observations, suggestions, comments. Yes? Uh, I don't know if it's a question, it's more for a remark. Uh, I'm going to come closer because okay. my hearing aids aren't okay. all that good for the situation. Yeah. There's a functional and anatomical distinction in uh, cognitive neuroscience and in neuroscience in general between the dorsal and ventral pathway. Both pathways are related to a different kind of vision. One is uh, the dorsal is uh, responsible for vision for action. So when you took the when you wanted to took the cookie, so yeah. it, and you didn't need to identify the properties or other other related feature, the dorsal uh, pathway was at work, and it works on something about like an egocentric. Uh, that's your map, the do you don't need to uh, locate the <coughs> properties of those objects. And the ventral object is what you said that was some kind of a conundrum. How, how can I take the object without uh, recognizing it? So there is some kind of research about uh, the <coughs> distinction between uh, different mechanisms, visual mechanisms related for different purposes of a certain organism, I guess. So yes. You're absolutely right, there's been a lot of work, and I th also think some conceptual confusion. For a while there's a called what versus where. Yeah, and so now it's uh, egocentric versus allocentric. Uh, right, and research. I have my own alternative label for what I think is going on in that case. There are some ways where information is acquired and instantly used, and there's no reason for it to be get. For instance, the information about the changing relationships between my fingertips and that thing, mm -hmm. and information which I can use and say to people, there's a plug on the table which you can use to stick into your projector which will do something, I don't know what, but it must be of some use because it's there. And there I'm, I can, I have to have kept some variant of that information in a form that enables it to be used at repeated stages in my sentence, but also maybe to remember yesterday. And in the one case, there's online, immediate use, and an extreme case, and overwritten because, and the stuff is overwritten because new information is coming in, and homeostatic mechanisms are typically like that. There may be other cases where information is just stored in case it would be useful, and it goes into some library of stuff, and there's a lot of, uh, I think there's a huge amount of stuff that goes on in, in young children, which is of that sort. They, they're acquiring all kinds of information, not because they need it, but because evolution found that the offspring of kids that acquired lots of information stored and then maybe later found it useful were more successful in life than the ones that didn't do that. So it's a collection, uh, it's, it's um, to do with the variety, the kinds of computation, the kinds of information processing, and getting the dis distin distinctions right is quite complicated. Anyway, but you're right to draw attention to that work. I think there's lots of data. I think often the descriptions of the data are not rich enough because the people haven't thought like engineers. Anyway, thanks for the example. So, I'll, I'll go back. Yeah. You may want to think how in this picture, how does sex fit, fits, into this, fits into this picture? Who? Because sex. Oh, how does sex fit into it? Because, uh, you know, for example, people have, have looked at, uh, as I said before, I mean, when you look at genetic algorithm, they use sexual reproduction and you compare them to maybe simulated annealing, which is asexual. Yes. It turns out the sex actually is not uh, such a great thing. Okay? That simulated annealing is a more efficient, typically, uh, combinatorial optimization algorithm. <laughs> so, so there is a whole question about, okay, why did sex evolve? And, and, said, and one of the answers is, in some you can think of sex by itself as a kind of high, some kind of a high-level mechanism, right? It's a, and it had to evolve, because we started with asexual reproduction early on. 
and uh, and some does argument that what sex give you is uh, actually better evolvability so it's almost at a higher level concept it give you an advantage not at the, almost at the level that uh, the individual but but to give you more variety if you have more variety then you have overall more chance for evolution to find for natural selection to find uh, instances that are good and you can keep them in the future I'm not going to give you my answer. I want to give you, let Susan give you hers, because she's obviously <laughs> thought about it, and it may or may not be the same as mine. We haven't discussed that. Don't call genetic. Don't think genetic algorithms got anything to do with biology. Full stop. No, he's saying if no, you no, add no, no, sexual representation. No, no, but you're yeah. saying that sex in genetic algorithms doesn't seem to give you any advantage as a combinatorial no, optimizer over simulated annealing. One, genetic okay. algorithms are barely, barely, you know, are related to the biological process about in name only. That's not the uh, point. And also biology is not um, a, uh, an optimizer. So, a so the end of your question was fine. What does sex do in biology? But the beginning of your question was a complete red herring. I disagree with you. But the no, point no. is that it's not clear, even evolution, if you look at evolution as whatever it yeah, is, that yeah. natural selection yeah. is, is, a, is why did sexual reproduction evolve? That, yeah. That's a good question, but, but the fact that it doesn't do anything for genetic algorithms is irrelevant because genetic algorithms bear no relationship to yes, the process the computational that's happening experiments in that we do. Uh, uh, are I mean, not yeah, bear, bear no relationship, I think, is a strong term that I think it's very hard to agree with. I, I, uh, you that, can so say it bears gross, so little relationship. You it's a gross abstraction, but to say bear no relationship is an no. extreme statement. That no, 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 it bear rela the bears no relationship to the biological process. Okay, can I just be a referee and copy now? And I'll just make a meta comment. I, I think sexual reprodu reproduction can be seen as an example of the stuff that Lynn Margulis talks about, which is things that involved in different mm. uh, evolutionary trajectories can often be brought together to produce novel and useful mm. combinations. And then she's talking about symbiosis, symbiosis. And sexual reproduction does that on a smaller scale. So partial solutions to problems can be brought together to, to be used in new, uh, in new situations in ways that would take much longer to develop if that combination had to evolve by uh, asexual reproduction, which I think is what Susan was getting at. And the fact that it didn't work in the uh, genetic algorithm experiments that people set up may just mean that they didn't have a rich enough genetic algorithm set up yes. in order to, yes. to yes. test out that yeah. thing. Yes. And and genetic, al genetic algorithms are utterly, utterly trivial compared to... No, uh, you can have more and less trivial... No, 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 even, even the less trivial ones are utterly trivial compared to the biological processes. Oh, because, okay. yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a, that's because a much fairer statement than to say there's no relationship. Well, but well, there's relationship almost in name only. You talk to a biologist about this stuff, you know, they go, they go okay. to hysterical laughter. But I think... But because, because, because it is such a, so simple, so small, and so much of the process is hardwired which in biology is actually part of the process. So things like um, and, the, and the mutation maybe, operators and, and, and so on. That's yeah. the state spaces, mm -hmm. state spaces, the search spaces don't have enough richness to benefit yeah. from the kind of thing yeah. in the mm -hmm. computational experiments, whereas they do in the biology. Anyway, uh, these are good questions. Mm -hmm. And in general, the main thing that uh, I, I think is important in Susan's answer is evolution is not an, not an optimizer. Mm -hmm. and if something happens to work and is useful, we can ask what actually happened in that lineage. Why did these things do better than the things on either side? But if you ask why is sexual reproduction better than asexual reproduction, the answer is who says it is? There are all kinds of things that still reproduce asexually and they do pretty well yes. on the planet. No, but, but still, there's still the question is why did sexual, repro sexual reproduction have to, was not there at the beginning, it had to evolve. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, why did it evolve? Okay, it so had to offer something, right? No. Otherwise, we want to evolve. Right. There are no. two questions. One is, uh, what kind of accidental, because it has to be accidental, change in the mechanisms made it possible for a kinds of organism that previously produced offspring somehow to get merged in the process of producing offspring? Very interesting question. I haven't yeah. asked. Probably some people on this planet have ideas about it that I haven't. And uh, that would be an, an interesting question. Second question, if that starts happening, how come the ones that do that in certain situations do better in later competitions than the ones that don't do that? Then we can start saying something about sharing of things that have been learned on different trajectories 
giving a wider range of competences to deal with the ways that dangers and opportunities turn up, which is the claim that was made about genetic algorithms, but maybe not tested enough. So um, I think one has to be careful about computational experiments in computers answering questions about real life. They can be suggestive, they can be inspirational, but the real tests have to come by looking at the richness of, and complexity and the mathematical structures that were out there. And then, perhaps, if you think you've understood it, you can test your theory on a running simulation. And that's getting easier because our computer is getting more powerful and also because our methods of observing and getting data... I mean, the things you can do with video recordings now, mm. observing little kids doing all kinds of things that previously depended on very observant parents taking notes because I have found, if I haven't got a video and I try to remember what it was that was so fascinating about the thing I saw that child doing, I tell someone, they say, no, you got it wrong. She didn't do that, she did so-and-so. But I can tell you that I've seen kids walking along, come to a lamppost, hand goes out to the lamppost to go around twice and they walk on again. Mm -hmm. um, what? Well, I, I have a sort of theory, but whether it's right or wrong, I don't know. Um, but I'm, it's not going to be possible to test that soon on a, in a computer. It has to do with using opportunities to just find out what sorts of things are possible and what happens if you try those possibilities. And if you do enough of that when you're not s threatened by life or death problems, then maybe you'll pick up useful information which 1% of the time is a lifesaver later on, or even 0.01% of the time is a lifesaver later on, or feeds into something else, which... Yes? Mm -hmm. um, so I hear so many lectures. I, I, let's we talked a few days ago about the um, success of mathematics, and you need to explain how, how uh, man 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 mathematics is so suitable to uh, to describe uh, the physical world. Do you remember who, who raised this question? I had an motion. You, you did? Yes. Yeah, so no, can you else? forget? <laughs> <laughs> and of course, uh, Mark Steiner. So, so Mark Steiner, it's a major uh, uh, point to discuss it. And I wonder if, if the story you gave us could give some kind of, a, uh, one kind of an answer, because this continuity that uh, you tried to, to, to argue for, I mean, uh, Evolution embedding within us unconsciously or, uh, some mathematical structures and this continuity that you claim to be between that and, and pre and pre Euclidean reasoning and, and so forth. Maybe that could be uh, quite an answer to this. Uh, well, I'm certainly question. claiming that the people who claim, as if I remember correctly, you half did, but I may be misremembering that mathematics is created, discovered, or, or somehow brought into existence by the activity of human mathematicians, are missing out on all this stuff. And I, don't, I think you're probably happy to accept that this stuff is, in some sense, making use of mathematical structure that was not created by human beings, and not created by me when I comment on it. I'm looking at what's going on, and I say, that looks as if there's some topological process, because the precise details of the motion don't seem to matter so much as the fact that there's a continuous trajectory and so on. And uh, th there are a lot of questions like, what information was she using to control the change of orientation of the pencil that she wasn't looking at? <laughs> and lots of nerves going to um, muscles and whatever. Uh, I don't think anybody right now has a good answer for what kind of brain mechanisms could do that kind of thing. And, I don't, and maybe if people look enough at things like that, they'll be able to say, they, they may come up with hundreds of they can then test on robots that have suitably articulated joints and super, super uh, um, appropriately designed computational states for testing with their theories about information structures. But I think at the moment, there's masses of data that's being ignored, and I just happen to be very inquisitive. Give me a child for half an hour, I'm very happy with that. Interacting with the child, just watching almost any child. And an or a crow, or a squirrel. Squirrels are absolutely amazing. There's <laughs> another thing. Go to, go to Google, type squirrel, squirrel-proof bird feeder. Mm -hmm. Some of you may already see <laughs> And the things that squirrels do to, to de <laughs> defeat human-designed bird feeders. Have any of you seen the rotary bird feeder? Which, when, that, when a bird lands on it, it's not heavy enough uh, to trigger the squirrel uh, a protection mechanism of the bird feed. If a squirrel lands on it, it's heavier. The, the device senses that, and it starts a motor that generates uh, circular motion, and squirrels get thrown off. 
<laughs> except in at least one of the videos you find a squirrel that does it twice and then goes up and instead of being thrown off, hangs on tightly while the thing goes round. <laughs> Then when it, uh, then it lets go, it goes down and eats the nuts. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the comments in it from, this is what the squirrel won now. <laughs> but I mean, I've seen them in our garden. We, we thought we had a squirrel poo thing on the end of a pole until the squirrel noticed something not there. I mean, it tried and failed to get up past the mm. barrier. It saw a butt uh, wooden thing with plants growing out of it. And it tried going on there and jumping, and a couple of times it missed, and then finally it managed to scrabble on and get to the thing. And uh, I even have one of, uh, uh, if you ever look at, I think it's on, I can't remember, one of my web pages. We had a, a glass pane on a window going out to the garden, sliding door, with plastic rim, you know the kind of thing. And uh, stuck in the middle of the pane was a bird feeder with a suction cup and nuts and so mm. on. And uh, one of the squirrels had realized that some of the nuts on the floor were coming from this thing. And my wife happened to see that it was trying to climb up and, f and mm -hmm. failing. But just by chance, on one occasion, one of these squirrels got up to about the right level and it's gripping onto something that's, mm -hmm. you know, about that thick with uh, its claws and so on. And they're along with a root that is impeded by this plane of glass so there's a narrow pathway in space and also impeded by uh, going too far will take you over it and take, going too low that one. so the narrow corridor it managed to launch itself sideways so it actually grabbed the uh, the feeder and was able to have a feeding and she has a picture of it halfway up this thing and a picture of it it's not a very clear picture uh, on the feeder and it's just an illustration now I there's got to be mathematical mechanisms in that squirrel's brain being able to take in the structures and work out possible processes and their consequences for it to even start that upward climb. <laughs> and I think Kant might have had squirrels in his garden for all I know, because <laughs> they've been around. There are <laughs> sorry? There are no squirrels there. Oh, sorry. But if you've observed squirrels, uh, you will, I always thought of squirrels as living proof uh, that motion is discrete. Uh, if you see the way squirrels operate, you know, they'll stand absolutely motionless, and the next thing you know, they're in the next spot. You know. do, do, um, do you have a way along Zeno? Yeah. <laughs> do, do, but you, if, do you have a model of, of how evolution manages to latch on to the, the mathematical structure of the situation, if not just trial and error? Um, well, I've said a few things that are very speculative very partial answers to that. Um, there, there are two separate questions there, I think. One is, how does it happen at all? Well, th for that you have to say the initial fundamental construction <laughs> kit, which comes from physics and chemistry, had enough richness to support all the things that happened later on, including <coughs> having richness enough to support all the things that haven't happened. And never will on this planet. Could, but could have, or could have on another planet. But the second one is, how are they found by evolution? Mm -hmm. And the answer Nothing there is, is, is not something I can add to, apart from the stuff that's already in all the evolution. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your help. So I, but I think I'm beginning to add a tiny fragment of an answer by talking about um, the memo functions, that things that have been used can be stored for reuse in the next genome, uh, things about mo moving up levels of abstraction and producing pa parameterized specifications so that bits can be plugged in to get the details while preserving the overall structure of something. And I don't know how many levels of abstraction it has. Th there's another one that comes from uh, human language learning where there seems to be a process of starting up data collection, and Annette Komolov Smith has lots of examples of this. And after quite a lot of data being collected and used in solving problems, something seems to happen, which she calls representational redescription. A bit of the brain either gets turned on or actually starts growing, or something which looks at what's been so far learned, the generalization, and tries to find, tries to instantiate some kind of mathematical structure in a higher level summary of all of that and the most spectacular well-known example of that is human language learning where kids develop lots of, lots of patterns that work 
and then after a while they transform that into a grammar based thing and then they get all sorts of things wrong that they didn't get right because English uh, language is not regular, there are lots of exceptions, so they then fix that by adding new software engineering front ends and back ends to the grammar so they can have handle inputs that are ungrammatical but correct and they can produce outputs that are ungrammatical but correct. Uh, if we're speaking about language learning, there's work by the linguist uh, Danny Fox that you know, uh, I think Aviv knows about, that um, where he uh, seems to have the you know the comes the, the result that children uh, learn um, dis um, continuous concepts before they learn uh, discrete ones. That you know the opposite of the way people in the foundations of mathematics think that the, these function, you know, these notions are related, but somehow the continuous is more, uh, is more fundamental, or at least, you know, psychologically prior uh, to uh, the uh, recognition of discrete structures. And, uh, I suspect that that's right for at least some subsets of the case. I don't right. know whether it's general. I, you know, I, I don't, I know of the work. But the reason know. why I think it is right, there's a lot, I believe a lot of uh, animal action is controlled by making use of more or less, I think I said that earlier, not the full mathematical continuum with all well, the yeah, contrary and stuff, but something... To say continuous is not to say the continuum. Sure, and where there's more of moreness and less of lessness and, and more of lessness and less of moreness and so on, and you can have a lot of that in the control of action, and they can be learning how, how to do that. and. Um, so I, I, at some point I must find, I didn't catch everything you're saying, but I'll perhaps... I can give you... Or maybe you already told me about it. But anyway, it's, I ought to look at it and see right. what it's being and said. And squirrels are the counterexample. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, right. I was about to say, I suspect there are counterexamples because although most of the activity in a world like ours is going to be continuous change, getting nearer, further, closing, releasing, so on, there will be transitions. For instance, if I want to put something in there, there's a transition between not being in the envelope, uh, or the, the, the cylinder that's above that, and being in that cylinder because only when I'm in it should I go down. So that would be a useful discrete transition. And there are many examples of that sort. So uh, I suspect the continuer themselves generate some of the where less turns to more or, or less stops and it just becomes fixed and so on. So the generalization, as you reported it, probably can't be true mathematically. It can't be true. How are we doing for time? Uh, well, think time to go for the cake? Yeah. Yes. A new day, a new cake. Yeah. Continuous and discrete.